Okay, so we're we're just after two o'clock, um, and I'm going to make a bit of a start on this. So we said two. Let's begin at two. It's zero hour. So bear with me while I just share the screen. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining me here this afternoon. And thanks to all of you for supporting the old front line via buy me a coffee or patreon I, I wanted to do something properly to to thank you for the support that you've given because it truly is appreciated and has enabled me to go from strength to strength in so many ways with the podcast so what we're going to do this afternoon is have a, a little bit of a chat like i said about the podcast itself how it came about how i do it and a little bit looking towards the future as well and then we'll go into a talk looking uh, a bit about the battlefields in the interwar period and to a degree bringing that up to to date as well so the podcast well this is the rig which i usually uh, record the podcast on this this particular photograph is a year or so old now but it's essentially the same bit of kit um, I use my MacBook um, and I use a bit of free software called GarageBand that comes with Mac. Um, so it's nothing fancy really, but I spend a bit of money on a decent microphone because I think sound is really, really important for podcasts. You can have fantastic content, but if people can't hear what you're saying, then obviously that's not much cop. So uh, decent microphone. And essentially how the podcast began was probably about 10 years ago, if I'm honest with you, when I did a couple of podcasts for Dan Snow for his channel. And it seemed to be podcasts were on a bit of a rise. And I bought a microphone then and I thought about doing it. And then my daughter stole the microphone for her music projects and so on. And it kind of felt as if a podcast had fallen by the wayside. And then about a couple of years ago, they seemed to be coming back. And I found myself doing a few more for Dan Snow and Matt McLaughlin and, and various others. And, and I thought I really must get around to doing this because over the years you collect all this information and stories and stuff that you, some of which is physical and a lot of it's tucked away in your head and really an opportunity to sort of put some of that across sometimes, but a podcast gives you a chance to do that. So I thought I must get around to doing this. And I said to myself at the end of 2019, whenever will I get a chance to really start this off? And then, of course, 2020 came along and, and everything that followed. So we have to see some positives um, out of this pandemic. And I'd like to think that enabling me to begin the process of doing these podcasts is, is certainly one of them. So I started off and, and a lot of people, I mean, quite a few of you have actually asked me, would I publish the, the, the transcripts um, or the, the scripts of the podcast that, that, that I do? Well, there, are, there aren't any scripts essentially what i do to make one of these is um i'd like to say there's a big scheme but there probably isn't i have a think each month about what i want to talk about in that month and and obviously if there's any particular anniversaries as there has been in july to time in with that at the beginning of this month we had the first of july 105th somme anniversary today it's the 104th anniversary of the third battle of eat passchendaele so that helps tie in subject matter and then what i generally do is write a running order on a six by four record card um, and use that to try and keep on track really as to what I'm talking about because in the early ones I guess I probably didn't keep on track sometimes which I'm sure you you weren't too bothered about because there's some interesting co uh, commentary and, and details and so on but it's probably tr best to try and keep in some sort of running order so I, I do that but then I just switch the microphone on and, and begin talking and, and I and I think that having particularly this last year having this time to pause and think about things has enabled me to do that and then express that through the the medium um, of the podcast and the podcast has gone from strength to strength i really didn't know if anyone would listen to it if i'm honest with you the ramblings of a of a battlefield guide who had no battlefields to actually go and guide on at that particular point um but it grew and grew and this month in particular has been a very busy incredible month 10% of the total downloads of the podcast occurred this month in July this uh, 2021. Now that's quite incredible, 10%. Um, and, and I think that 
I thought that possibly after, as things began to relax and we all went back to normal, then maybe people would stop listening. But in fact, it's grown and that's a really, really good thing. So I'm really grateful for that. And I'm grateful for all of you who tweet about it, write about it on social media, email your friends, send the links around, post it on Facebook. You know, it really, really does help. And the reviews on Apple Podcasts and all the other things that many of you have done, that also helps as well and puts it pushes it up the uh, the ranking. The really nice thing is on Apple Podcasts now, it's remained in the top 100 shows for history for about the last five or six months, which is a big achievement for the podcast because it's an independent. It's not backed by a media company or a, a name, big name individual. It's just me producing it on my MacBook. So that's been really good. And again, that is down to you guys um, supporting the podcast and all that you do. So that's that's what we do now. Looking ahead, uh, I just wanted to run through with you. Ah, okay, we've got first. Uh -huh. Uh, the f some ideas, well, some some outline of the future of the old front line. Well, I mean, the last year or so has proved that we can never predict the future, but we've got to have a bit of a, a plan. And the podcast, even though as we head back towards work, will continue on a regular basis, hopefully every week. Uh, it might be occasionally, it might be every other week. I mean, who knows? But my my plan is to continue to do it every week. And it will always, always, always be free. And this was a fundamental aspect uh, when I started the podcast in the first place, was not to turn this into something where people had to pay to access it. It had to be free. And I think that is one of the good things about podcasts is that they're out there and anyone can listen to them anywhere in the world, at any time, on any device, and it's totally and utterly free. Now, some platforms have moved towards the idea of charging people for podcasts. Apple has started it. I'm sure Spotify will follow. I don't intend to follow that route, and I actually don't think it's going to be very successful, despite all of their claims. So it will always, always be free. The podcast will, there'll be never any charge. And even if Apple or any of the big players suddenly charge you for accessing podcasts on their platforms, I would ensure that it was in a location where you could listen to it for free. It's really, for me, free access to history like this is really, really important. Again, as we move forward, as the world begins to emerge and hopefully in the next few months we can return to the battlefields of the Great War, um, I hope to do more recordings on the battlefields themselves. Now, last year, last July, in between lockdowns, I managed to get out to the battlefields with two of my friends, Mark and Tim, and, and I recorded a couple of episodes there. And I think that it added a, another level to it. I did it on some fairly basic recording equipment, an old iPhone, fairly decent mic and a bit of a rig to mount them on but um i think what i got from that particularly the episode on tying cop added a, a different sort of dimension to it which which was really good and thanks to you guys and your support through patreon and buy me a coffee i bought some much better recording equipment now which i used for the first time uh, during wargraves week when i interviewed my pal martin in barnsley cemetery and the, the richness of the bird sound in the background and the trees and the wind and everything else, I think, again, it added another level to it. So I, I can't wait to use that on the ground itself. So that's going to be how the podcast will change in terms of the content. And I'll probably go back to some of the places that we've already discussed in episodes to not re-record them, but to record a different view of it by actually being there and getting the sounds of it. Because I think the sounds whether it's the birds, the wind in the trees, the gates opening, the gravel, I really do think that adds something to it. And then as we move forward, the other thing that I'm looking to do as part of this is video content. Now, with the podcast, I can paint a picture of what you're looking at. And I know quite a lot of you like that and you use Google Earth and Street View and so on to follow it. Um, but I think there are times when I, I just wish I could show you something as I'm talking to you. And I think video content will be part of that. And, and I've just bought some kit. Again, thanks to you guys supporting has enabled me to, uh, to get a new bit of kit, which is um, <laughs> to produce some, some video on the ground out there. And my plan is that that will be shared so that supporters like you will see it first. I've already set up a, 
a YouTube channel for the old front line. It's got some of my old video content on there. And then once I start producing this, the new stuff will go on there eventually. But I want the supporters like yourselves to see that first. And that's, uh, I'll be looking into ways of doing that um, as we go forward. And then after it's been there for a little while, it will then go on to YouTube uh, for everyone to see. So that's another aspect of the future of the old front line. And then the old front line community, what's that? Well, that's a good question. What is it? Well, I, I just feel as if, I mean, every week, thousands of you download the episodes. So it, it's a big grouping of people who are, I presume, all fascinated, all interested, all passionate about the battlefields of the First World War. And I think by default, we've already created a sense of community because we're all singing from the same hymn sheet when it comes to our passion for this subject and our desire to visit and preserve and understand these battlefields. I'm not quite sure yet what we can do with that, but I, I just think it's a positive force and perhaps something we could do something with. And I, I am open to ideas so if you've got some ideas ping me an email via the old frontline website there's a email link on there or you can send me a direct message on twitter or whatever um then ping me some ideas um i mean if nothing else it might be an opportunity to meet up on the ground over there and walk some of the ground together um and you know battlefields do change in my time i've seen things disappear and occasionally things come under threat and it'd be quite good to have a group of like-minded people to act as a bit of a spokesman group spokesperson group uh to uh to, to push for things perhaps not to change in quite the way they might who knows like i say, i don't really know but that one i think is should be all part of, of going forward because you know so many of you do listen and we are all connected by our interest and fascination to these battlefields so that's a bit about the old frontline podcast that's a little bit about the future and now let's get on to the much promised talk so this afternoon we're going to talk about après la guerre after the war the battlefields between the wars and when we think of the great war battlefields we think of, of images like this this is a, a press photograph showing uh, an officer accompanied the um, official photographer walking down the shell smash road at Guillemont on the Somme in 1916. All of the images you're going to see this afternoon are from originals in my private collection that I've been building up over many, many years. So there are other real photographic images like this one. This is a, a wartime press photo print um, or they're real photographic postcards or they're postcards from, from the period. Um, images I think have always fascinated me and I think they, they give such an insight into what it was like. So that's how we see it during the war. And um, and if we look at this, uh, this map here, which comes from French uh, Wikipedia, this shows the extent of the devastation of the Western Front after the First World War. Now, this is drawn from a, a map from about 1919-20, which I, somewhere I have an original of, but I haven't yet found it. Um, so the one from French Wikipedia will do. And what we see on here is the red area, the much talked about and famous Zone Rouge, the red zone, the area of absolute total destruction. Then the yellow zone, which is a similar area of destruction, but not quite total. Some things had survived. And then the green zone, which was the next phase down where there's damage, but not catastrophic damage on the scale of the battlefields. And it only includes northern France and, and eastern France. It misses off Flanders to the top, which would be pretty much all red. Um, and if you look at it, if you look at the red area, you'll see that it follows the line of the Western Front. And um, that's that gives you an indication that where the fighting was at its fiercest, that's where the total area of destruction was at its greatest. And that really isn't much of a surprise because if you look at it, it's west of Lille, down past Bethune and Lens. So that's in the area of the Forgotten Front where the offences of 1915 took place. And it comes down into the ground around Arras, then down to the Somme and Cambrai and the ground east of Amiens, and then across the Aisne to, towards the Marne, and then over the Chemin des Dames near Lens, south of Lens, uh, over towards the Champagne, east of Reims, and through the Argonne to Verdun, and then across towards eastern France, towards the end of the Western Front. And 
when we when we think of the battlefields of the Great War, we think of images like this. This is a, um, I posted one today as part of the preview image for today's podcast from the same photographer. He was a, a, an ordinary soldier in the 15th Royal Welsh Fusiliers, the London Welsh, and he took a whole series of photographs with a professional camera. How he got away with it, I don't know, but he took a whole series of them and I picked them up in one of these much famed Sussex junk shops back in the 1980s. This one shows the Pilkelm Ridge, where 104 years ago today there was an attack across this ground. This is very close to Artillery Wood. The trees you can see there are almost certainly the trees of Artillery Wood. And across to the right is, uh, a, is a railway, uh, some railway trucks on the line of the railway line that runs from Eat to Rulers, which is now a footpath and cycle path. And they're pretty close, I think, to where the Francis Ledwich Memorial is located, for those of you that have been to the, that part of the of the Flanders battlefields. So this is our sort of typical view of what much of the Western Front was like. That's it during the war, that's it in 1917. And then as the war ends and the peace begins, this is what is left of it. So this is a one of a whole series of Nels postcards. Nels was a Belgian postcard publisher who had done picture postcards for Edwardian tourists and now different type of tourists was coming to Belgium to visit places like this. But what it does do, of course, is give us an insight into just how devastated places in the Zone Rouge were. This is what was left of the village of Polkapel, northeast of Ypres. We can see that most of what's left standing are not pre-1914 buildings, but concrete bunkers built by the Germans. And the whole place is smashed to bits and we can only just about see that it's a village rather than smash fields because the colour of it's slightly different and we can see some bricks and so on. In fact, many of the veterans that I interviewed in the 80s and 90s often said that you only really knew you were coming into a village because the colour of the ground changed where it had been uh, permeated by the brick dust and the stone dust of the structures that had once stood there. So this is typical of that zone rouge. And then this image, which I've used for the old Frontline podcast, and which is, appears on the very first website that I ever put online in 1999. This is, again, this is a, a photograph taken by an Australian photographer in 1919 who photographed the battlefields where Australians had fought. And it's a fantastic photograph with the light coming down through the clouds. And it shows the ground between Pozieres on the Somme and the village of Corselet, where I lived for many years. It shows the moonscape there, the shell smashed ground already in the spring of 1919, nature is beginning to reclaim it. And across to the right of that officer, in the distance, if you look carefully, there is the wreck of a tank, a Mark I tank that was uh, ditched there during the first use of tanks in September of 1916. So again, this is what the battlefields were like in that immediate period after the Great War. The whole infrastructure of all the towns and cities was also so badly damaged that it meant living there was very, very difficult. This is the Lille Gate at Ypres showing the smashed ramparts and the buildings and the entranceway to the city. But also importantly, we can see propped up by timbers beneath the archway, the underground archway of the sewer and the fresh water system of Ypres built in medieval times and is what gave Ypres its, its great attraction to people because it invested money in its infrastructure of sewers and fresh water so that life expectancy in Ypres in medieval times was much higher than other places. But this had all been smashed a bit. So it meant that these towns had not just had their buildings destroyed, that had their infrastructure destroyed. There was no fresh water, there was no sewage. And that meant that the potential for disease and all sorts of other problems to spread was all part of that legacy of the post-war period that people had. And if we have a picture of the Lille Gate, we have to have a picture of the Menning Gate. This is from an album I picked up about a year ago of an officer who ran a, a training uh, centre for the British Army in France at the end of the war and then came back to the battlefields at least twice. And um, they uh, and he then um, uh, visited uh, the battlefields and took a number of photographs like this. We can see that there are people going about their business. There's the ruins of the cloth hall. You can just see if you squint a bit in the distance. And um, there on the right is the walls, the ramparts. But in the background, we can see some buildings already being uh, reconstructed. So it shows that the movement of from one phase of desolation to reconstruction. 
but in most places, and this EEP is, is the example I'm using, this is the this is what it was like. This is the St. Martin's Cathedral at EEP, completely destroyed after four years of war. British Tommies trying to figure out how they're going to clean up this mess, sitting amongst the ruins there. And that was what people faced when they returned to these places. And here's the famous cloth hall that stands like some sort of Neolithic monolith as a monument to an ancient civilization. Um, standing there amongst the ruins of the city of Ypres. So how does life become normal again? Well, people did return. The war ended in November 1918, and um, people began to return in that winter period of 1918-1919. So January 19 was when most people began to come back. Where could they live? They couldn't live in the ruins, in the rubble, and in the crushed cellars and so on so the government the Belgian government in France the same laid on barracks like this so this is an Ypres this is the provisional housing put up for the citizens of Ypres and the surrounding area and this is where they came and lived in wooden huts with big pot boiler stoves fairly basic accommodation but better than living out in the rough of the wilds of this ruined area of Flanders and the same across the border in France and as the city of Ypres rebuilt and we saw already in those that picture from early 1920s houses were being rebuilt people gradually went back into the city but out in the villages it took much longer it wasn't really until 1922 23 that a lot of these villages were rebuilt so people lived in this type of accommodation for up to three four years in some cases before they went back to uh, where they'd originally lived and that meant that during the day they were in these villages reclaiming the ground finding out where things had been, trying to work out where their house had been and so on. Um, and then at night, they came back to Ypres and they slept here. And it meant the battlefields were totally deserted at night. Now, Henry Williamson, who was a, a great writer who'd fought in the First World War, he was a nature writer, really, but he wrote quite a lot about visiting the battlefields, recalls this and said for him that it was very, very strange to go out to these battlefields at night when no human was there, only the wildlife and there was no noise. It was silent. And he was used to the staccato of the machine guns, the crack of rifles, the crush of shells going off and the hiss of gas. And then now it was silence and it really sort of evoked all the spirits and the memories and the ghosts of the war for him and made it quite a difficult place for him to visit. I think over a hundred years later, over a century later, for us, for me, going up onto the Bellawada Ridge at night or walking the ground around High Wood on the Somme in the evening, actually, this is, I think, where the crisscross paths of the Great War come together. So I suppose the atmosphere has changed and we see it differently to them, I guess, anyway. So that's the level of destruction and the beginning of reconstruction. And that led to, of course, as well, the development of what was on those battlefields. And one of the one of the principal aspects of that is what I often refer to as the beacons of the Great War, which are the silent cities, the cemeteries. And this is the very first one of all. This is Le Trepor, cemetery number one, built just after the war, using the designs as put forward by the architects of the then Imperial War Graves Commission. And this is at Le Trepor on the French coast, one of three experimental cemeteries that was built at that time to give an idea as to how this whole process of commemorating the dead would work. Because if we look at this picture of the Royal Berkshire Cemetery at Plugstert, and if you've been there, um, the, uh, the Royal Barks across the road, the original one, is behind the photographer, the Plug Street Memorial would be to your left. But this, more importantly for us, this gives us an indication of what wartime cemeteries were like. Wooden crosses, pretty well organised this one because it was behind the lines what to do with cemeteries like this. They wouldn't last indefinitely, the crosses would rot. If it was left to the families, poor old Mrs. Smith from Manchester would not be able to afford the cross. And then the family of a, of a titled aristocrat would come along and put a big monument on there. So the government took on responsibility through the Imperial War Graves Commission formed during the war in 1917 to make these permanent cemeteries. But there were of course all sorts of problems in doing that because even the cemeteries themselves had been damaged. This is Kemmel Chateau Cemetery, uh, which was just behind the front line in, in front of the Messines Ridge. And we can see quite a few crosses in here, dinged and dented and damaged by shell fire. And in some cemeteries, they were just blown to bits, which is why some cemeteries have a lot of special memorials in. So the task was, if you excuse the pun, 
quite a monumental one to try and turn these cemeteries into something permanent, but they did. And this is a 1930s image of Tyne Cot Cemetery at Passchendaele showing the, the largest example of all, but a typical example of what the cemeteries became. And the interesting thing about this image is the way that it's planted. Gertrude Jekyll, who was the, the horticulturalist that was uh, responsible for um, the way these cemeteries were presented in terms of their garden effects, you can see it very, very stark and, and vivid here. And when I first went to Tynecott in 1982, it was pretty much unchanged. And then in the 90s, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, as what it had become by then, uh, suffered from a, quite a funding uh, crisis, really. And they rationalised a lot of the garden. And, and this all disappeared, really, for a while. I'm pleased to say that in the lead up to the centenary and during the centenary, the commission did an absolutely astonishing job of returning the cemeteries to looking like this. So this could really be a picture taken of Tyne Cot today in many respects, because that style of planting and the way that the plants uh, and the horticulture was used to convey the garden look is something that is very, very present in the cemeteries today and something that I think is a really, really important part of what they are. But not just British cemeteries, of course, German ones as well. This is the German cemetery at Polkapel, northeast of Ypres, a cemetery made during the Second Battle of Ypres when the ground was captured and then used by frontline units. It was one of probably several dozen cemeteries, but German cemeteries around Ypres up until the 1950s. We looked at this in an episode on Langemark Cemetery, uh, the way that the, the German cemeteries were moved in following the Second World War. And this cemetery was closed and the burials were moved to both Langemark uh, in the mass grave and to Menin as well. All that remains of it today is the brick wall you can see in the front of the photograph there. It's still there, as is the gate. Uh, today, the ground is a child's playground as part of the school. It's in the school grounds, which is perhaps a good use of a site like this. I'll let you uh, decide that one. But Langemark is probably one of the greatest expressions of the way the Germans commemorated their dead, if not one of the greatest expressions of war cemeteries from the Great War. And this is the, the, the monumental entrance to Langemark, uh, showing what is a very stark approach to the commemoration of the dead in great contrast to sites like Tynecott, but reflecting a changing world within Germany. This was from the early 1930s with the rise of extreme politics of both sides with the right national socialism uh, beginning to gain ground and eventually the influence of the rise of the Nazis would have its influence on sites like this. So where the big wreath is on the left hand side, which is a style of commemoration that you see on many what I would describe as Nazi monuments within Germany itself at the time, above it is a plaque and that plaque reads Deutschland muss leben und wenn wir sterben müssen, Germany must live even if we must die. And this was a favourite saying of Adolf Hitler's, uh, it's a quote from 1914, and of course by the time this picture postcard was published we were less than a decade away from Germans dying again in, in another world war, sadly. But we can't forget the French either, and this is uh, typical of, of quite a few French cemeteries. Um, off the beaten track, we tend to think of the big ones like Notre Dame de Lorette or Douaumont at, uh, at Verdun. This is at Soie uh, in the Champagne on the Bout de Soie, the high ground above the village, where the Champagne offensive went in in September of 1915 and fighting in this area continued on and off for much of the rest of the war. It's an unusual cemetery, it commemorates a particular action and particular units. The headstones are arranged in that manner and there's some which are not actually in this photograph which were possibly added later that almost look like television sets they're quite really unusual designs um it's one of the most unique uh, cemeteries in terms of its design i think anywhere on the western front but as you can see at this particular juncture which is about 19 19 20 it survives it's surrounded rather by trenches and barbed wire and german field guns none of which i'm I'm sad to say are there to today, but the cemetery very much is. And, and these are themselves, just like our cemeteries, beacons across the landscape that mark the site of where the French army uh, fought. You know, in many respects, and I, I've possibly said this in the podcast before, the true Western Front begins beyond the Somme because that's where we see some of the greatest examples of preservation of battlefields, whether accidental or, or deliberate, um, and also the, the greatest amount of 
of remains of evidence of the war itself. So if you have cemeteries, you naturally lead on to pilgrimages to those cemeteries. And this is a group of men of the 11th Suffolks, uh, the Cambridgeshires, uh, a Powell's battalion uh, recruited in 1914 uh, on the 20th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme on the 1st, 1st of July 1936, going across to visit their battlefields where they'd fought and visit the graves of their comrades. And that pilgrimage began really with things like this during the war. The Imperial War Graves Commission sent these little cardboard folders with a photograph of a grave to thousands of families in Britain who requested them. They sent photographers out to photograph them and they were put on, into a little wallet like this with the details of the soldier and where he was uh, buried and, and how you got there, the nearest railway station. This is uh, commemorates Sergeant uh, Ernest Dean, who was a local lad, as I see here now I'm looking across the valley to the next village of Jump, and he came from Jump. He's on the war memorial there. He was in the local bat territorial battalion, the 1st, 5th York and Lanx. He was killed at the Bozinger sector in 1915 and buried in Bard Cottage Cemetery near to the village of Bozinger. And when people received this, they obviously saw that there was a grave there and, and they were moved to try and visit it at some point. I don't know whether Sergeant Dean's family ever did. Quite a few people from Barnsley did go across in the 20s and 30s, but I'm not sure whether his family did, but it led to instances like this. And this is a couple of photographs I got a while back uh, showing a mother visiting her son's grave at Addingkirk Cemetery, uh, which is on the Belgian coast in North Flanders. And unfortunately, the picture is slightly overexposed, so you can't read any of the writing on it or see what the headstone is. And I haven't as yet had a chance to go back there to line this up to see which grave it is. And I'm sure that might be possible because it's not a very big cemetery. All that's written on the back is a date uh, and something like uh, mum visiting the grave. Uh, so there's no indication as, as to who it is, but it gives us a bit of an insight into the thousands of mothers, the thousands of families that went across like this. And not just British families, because on the left there is the brother of a French poilu visiting his brother's grave, killed with a French regiment uh, on the Luz battlefield in 1915 and buried in Bully Grenet Communal Cemetery. Um, and that's a picture from the 1920s. And the one on the right is one I picked up not long ago, uh, which is a remarkable photograph, one of the first of these I've ever seen. And it shows a German family visiting a German war grave. I would guess by the look of those two that they are brother and sister and possibly visiting either their father's grave or their brother's grave, I don't know. But once Hitler came to power, um, a lot of Germans began to travel within Europe again. They felt it was acceptable now, nearly 20 years after the Versailles Treaty, Germans could travel and Germans did travel and they made pilgrimages to graves like this in exactly the same way that French families did and British and Commonwealth families did, but there's little evidence of it. So to come across a photograph like this is, is quite extraordinary, really. Those are the graves because you have many, many soldiers who have no known grave. And one of the great problems facing the Imperial War Graves Commission was what to do with these. And that led to monuments like this, the Menin Gate at Ypres, one of the first to be unveiled in July, 1927. And a year later, uh, with the playing of the last post, cemented it really as one of the main British memorials of the Great War, commemorating 55,000 British and Commonwealth soldiers who died at Ypres, who through the fortunes of war have no known grave. And uh, this gave families of the missing something to come and visualise that casualty, to, to make that casualty real and, and to add what we would now probably call closure, I suppose. Um, and it was a vital part, I think, of remembrance at that time, uh, because with no grave, there was always the hope that they might come home and monuments like this, a decade after the end of the war, nearly proved that they were never coming home. And this is a, a couple of photographs that uh, came from, from a, the GP90 um, tour we did in 2018 for the British Legion which was a, a replication of their great pilgrimage of 1928. And this is from that August 1928 pilgrimage. It shows the two ladies on the trip and this was their father, the young lad on the left, standing underneath his father's name on the Tynecott Memorial with his mother, 
holding a pencil against his father's name so you could see where it was on the photograph. And his dad was Bertie Cowgill of the 8th Northumberland Fusiliers, who was killed in the Battle of the Steambeak on the 16th of August 1917 and commemorated here on the Tynecott Memorial. And the family was from Colne and in Lancashire. So again, this gives us an insight into what it was like for the families of missing soldiers to come back and visit, you know, with a wall covered in names, how do you visit it? What do you do? And we see them, this is how they approached it. This is how they dealt with it, if you like, when they went to Tynecott in 1928. So if you have the creation of, of cemeteries and memorials to the missing, naturally you're also going to have memorialization, the creation of wider monuments. And this is the three buglers playing the last post at the unveiling of the, of the Thiepval Memorial in 1932. But across the landscape there, we can see two memorials, the white obelisk on the right, the 18th Eastern Division Memorial on the edge of Thiepval Village, and in the distance, the Ulster Tower on the spot where the Ulster Division had fought on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. These type of memorials went back to the war itself. The battlefield was littered with them. This is a wooden cross on the edge of the shattered Trones Wood, showing the men, uh, re remembering the men of the 18th Eastern Division who captured it in August of 1918. They'd also fought there again previously in July of 1916 in the capture of the wood. And what happened at the end of the war was lots of units wanted to put up memorials like this, but there were too many. So a committee was formed and you had to apply for the right to have a memorial. And not everybody got that right. There are files of these in the National Archives in London uh, indicating the ones that were refused and sometimes the reasons that they were refused. Uh, and in many cases, some units wanted just too many, but the 18th Eastern Division got away with three, one here at Trones, the one we saw in the previous picture at Thietvale, and also one at Clapham Junction on the Menin Road at Ypres. And, and of course that led to eventually the, the building and creation of these new monuments. This is uh, the unveiling of the 47th London Division Memorial at High Wood on the Somme. You can see uh, that dark corner of, of the Somme High Wood regrowing naturally in the background there, um, but a shattered landscape and a shattered landscape that decades after this photograph was taken would mean that the foundations of the memorial were no longer fit to sustain it and it had to be taken down and then rebuilt on a much smaller scale because eventually that legacy of what shells had done to high wood caught up with the construction of this memorial. Now I've often said in the podcast there's a connection between the type of unit that the, uh, men served in and the creation of a memorial and, and the publication of a unit history. And this is the unveiling of the 55th West Lanx Division Memorial at Givinci in Northern France um, in the 1920s. And those officers are from the King's Liverpool Regiment, which was one of the biggest regiments within that division. They're all territorials. So they recruited locally um, and retained that local recruitment and existence as units after the war. So because they still existed, because men had gone back home, because there was a good old comrade association, that led to a fundraising exercise to build the memorial and also the publication of a divisional history. So all of those things are part of the memorialization process and all part of the connected history of these things that we see along the battlefields. There was also the unveiling of memorials to the missing. This is the Latour Memorial in Northern France, commemorating those who died on that sector of the battlefields from October 1914 until the eve of the Battle of Luz in 1915 and typical of the, th the crowds, thousands of people who came over in that interwar period to attend unveiling ceremonies like this, no doubt people that had relatives on the memorial. And for, for things like uh, the Menin Gate and uh, the Thiepval Memorial, 10,000 people were in those crowds, and absolutely staggering numbers. And I read that in the 1930s, at one stage, a quarter of a million English-speaking people were visiting the battlefields of the First World War in northern France and Flanders, an absolutely staggering number that we didn't see anything close to again until the Great War centenary. Ooh, there we go. But it wasn't just British memorials. Um, of the many Empire Commonwealth monuments, the Indian Corps Memorial at New Chapelle is a fine one, still under construction when this postcard was, was published. The difference, of course, is there was no Indian uh, pilgrimage to the battlefields because it, it was just not even considered, I would guess, to be honest with you. There were Indian Army soldiers present at the unveiling of this, 
men who'd served in the Great War and were still in uniform, but the connection between bringing parties of people from India to remember the more than 4,000 Indian Army soldiers commemorated on here, like I say, I'm sure was something that because of the time and attitudes of the time was not even considered, which is a sad thing. But again, a positive outcome of the centenary is a growth of interest in India and the arrival of a lot of Indian groups on the battlefields to visit these places, which is only to be welcomed. So the last cemetery uh, and mem memorial to the missing was built in September 1938, an outbreak one year before the outbreak rather of the, of the Second World War. So where does World War I meet World War II? Well, this is a press photograph um, from the War Illustrated showing a two pounder anti-tank gun dug in uh, in front of the, of the Menning Gate at, uh, at Ypres in May 1940. And indeed, the battle swept across these old battlefields again. The fight returned. This is a, a photograph I have, one of a series of private German photographs taken by a German soldier in uh, May 1940, showing the fight in Flanders. It's a German anti-tank gun, 37 millimeter door knocker, as it's called, um, set up on the Menin Road, halfway, well, more than halfway between Menin and Ypres. Ypres to the right, five kilometers, Menin to the left, 13 kilometers. And actually where it is, the just beyond that hedge, which is still there to this day, um, is Stirling Castle, a rebuilt chateau on, uh, that was built on the spot of a chateau with the same name. And just to the left is Clapham Junction, where the 18th Eastern Division Memorial is. Now I have another photograph in this series where the photographer went to his left and took a shot of that monument. But not just here in Flanders, but right across these old battlefields, actions took place in that May and June of 1940 period. And cemeteries were damaged, monuments were damaged, places were damaged. Ypres came under fire again and suffered a lot of damage to its structures. I think more than 500 buildings in Ypres were damaged. And lots of detritus was left on these battlefields. This is the memorial to the American 27th and 30th divisions uh, near Kemmel, facing the Messines Ridge. That's the Messines Ridge between Wichata and uh, Mess Messines in the background. Um, and this is a, a British Army 1500 weight truck from the 5th Division that was being used to evacuate people back towards Dunkirk during the withdrawal in May 1940, for whatever reason was abandoned there and just left in front of the memorial. And this was a shot taken by a German soldier about that time. But they, the Germans as well added to cemeteries and added to British cemeteries with their own dead. So this is a photograph showing the graves of three German Wehrmacht soldiers killed in the village of Contal Maison on the Somme and buried in Contal Maison Chateau Cemetery. And their graves remained there until the 1950s when they were moved to the main German cemetery near Amiens in the valley of the river Somme. And there is quite a lot of photographic evidence to show that numerous cemeteries, particularly on the Somme, were used as German burial sites during this period. With Western Europe now conquered by Nazi Germany, there was a German occupying force and they began to visit these battlefield sites. And that's some Germans at the Menin Gate in 1940, coming to see what it was all about. And this is after the reconstruction of the road bridge, which they're standing on, which the Royal Engineers blew up in May 1940. And that's what caused most of the damage to the Menin Gate at that time. They visited cemeteries. This is a picture of some German soldiers in a the British cemetery uh, on the battlefields between Arras and, and Combray. Um, it looks a little bit overgrown, so that could be a little way into the war. There's no date on this one, so it's difficult to know when, when, it, when it was. Some gardeners had stayed behind, some had got back to Britain via Dunkirk. In some cases, gardeners were allowed to continue to tend cemeteries. In others, they weren't. It seemed to have depended on the local German commander. But a lot of Germans visited these cemeteries. I think I've said in the podcast before, that uh, when I first went to the Somme in 82, there was a cemetery called Wagon Road Cemetery near Beaumont Hamel that had one of the original visitors books in it that went back to before the Second World War. And it had a large number of German names in it from the World War II period where they'd signed the book. Because these were the sons of men who'd fought in the war quite likely. And they knew the names of these battles and battlefields and probably wanted to go and see what they were all about themselves. And this is a photograph taken from the top of the Thiepval Memorial by a German soldier in, in 1940, showing the, the Thiepval Anglo-French Cemetery and the cleared area of grounds leading up to the Utwee Thiepval Road, which is the commission cleared again in the lead up to the centenary. You can see that sort of bit of a shaky uh, 
trench going across from left to right, which is still there to this day. Um, the top of the Thietval Memorial was uh, ironically more open in the Second World War when the Germans were the occupying forces than at any other period, although locals have told me that towards 1944 you couldn't go up. Um, a lot of locals used to go up there to catch pigeons. My old friend Eve, who was a Wargraves Commission gardener from 47 to the early 90s, went up there as a boy in the Second World War and got locked up there one night when the Germans shut the doors. And he spent the night on the top of the Thiepval Memorial. His mother thought he'd been arrested by the Gestapo, but thankfully not. Um, so they went and visited places like this. But then jumping on four years, following the landings in Normandy on D-Day and the arrival of uh, the British Liberation Army and the Americans, 21st Army Group came up through the battlefields of the First World War. And uh, this is uh, from a collection of photographs I have taken by a, an officer in the Royal Engineers, that's him there, taken uh, as he moved up from Normandy up into Holland and eventually Germany. And he stopped along the way to visit some of these great war sites. So this is the Newfoundland Park at Beaumont Hamel. It's the old keeper's lodge on the right there and at the entrance to the, the trenches, which is where the trees are on the, uh, on the left there. And then he went on to photograph Thiepval on the day it was liberated, showing two French women walking up to the memorial and the Ulster Tower, as it was when he went through there in September 1944. But jumping on to after World War II, um, the years that followed, and that's a phrase that Martin Middlebrook coined um, in, in his books, where he did a sort of a follow-up chapter about the men uh, who he wrote about in his, in his stories to do with the Somme and the Kaiserschlacht and so on. But it, it's valid here. And, and in that photograph there, that very proud gentleman there is John Giles, the founder of the Western Front Association, an author of several absolutely fantastic books about the Great War, Eat Then and Now, The Somme Then and Now, and The Western Front Then and Now, um, all of which are still in print via After the Battle. And he was a good friend of mine and sadly John died nearly well, in fact, over 30 years ago now uh, and I inherited a big box of his photographs of which this is one of them giving us a bit of an insight into what the battlefields were like in that post-war period when he began to visit from the 1950s onwards and this is one of his photographs of the men in road at Ypres pretty much unchanged since the reconstruction and not too different except the cars and so on uh, from when the BEF marched down there in the first battle of Eton in 1914 the railway line still going across the road um, the the tree-lined roads some of the original buildings at this particular time with the reconstruction we've got the demarcation stone on the left hand side near to that Belgian gendarme there and there was a little cafe on the right hand side which you can see as well this remained pretty much like this. This is what it was like when I first went there in 1982. And then in the approach to the 90s, they completely changed this and turned it into the big roundabout that many of you will know now. John also photographed a lot of the mine craters. On the left there is the Wysap crater in the early 1970s. That's in uh, Mash Valley on the Somme. Overlas Cemetery in the background there and the village of Overlas. The Wysap crater was the main mine crater visited by tourists on the battlefields in the 1920s and 30s. It wasn't the Lochnagar crater, it was the Wysap crater because it was right by the side of the main road. Uh, but then in the post-war period, post-Second World War period, the farmer saw that no one was visiting anymore and uh, he filled it in and that led to Richard Dunning acquiring the, uh, uh, the Lochnagar crater in the 1970s and preserving it for posterity. So. This one sadly didn't survive, there's houses on it now, uh, but you can see the scars of it in the ground in the winter months, but Loch Nagar, what came out of it was the preservation of another crater, which is probably the best known crater today. And on the right there is uh, a shot taken where Geoffrey Mallins had his uh, camera on the 1st of July filming the explosion of the Hawthorne mine, and that's what the crater looked like in the late 1960s, early 1970s, not a lot of trees in it. And it's been returned to that now by the excellent Hawthorne Crater Association who've made the crater far more accessible than it ever was, which again, can only be a good thing. That brings me to the Great War Battlefields. And this is not from my very first trip. This is in the early nineties when I used to go across with my old friend, Andrew. Uh, I first went in 1982 um, and that sort of began my path, the battlefields were largely unchanged. I think, you know, it felt that, that they remained in this backwater for decades and decades. 
and there was so little change. But of course, in the last two decades, as the explosion of tourism has begun, we've seen a lot of change. And this is the bunker, um, the Australian engineer built bunker on top of a German bunker uh, on Hill 60 in Flanders. And it looks very, very different today, far more overgrown and the grass a little bit more worn than we see in that photograph. But at that time, there were lots of things to see that have now gone. These are two graves of men killed on the first day of the Somme. Brigadier General Bertie Prowse on the left. He was buried at Leuvencourt and Lieutenant Colonel Percy Michel, who was the commander of the Lonsdale Battalion of the Border Regiment, who's buried at Wailoi Ballon Communal Cemetery Extension on the Somme. You can see that they've got things in front of their graves. That was a very common thing to see in the 80s, a plaque that was on Bertie Prowse's grave from when he was originally buried at Vauxhall and that big bronze wreath listing the battle honours of Colonel Michel where he'd fought as a Victorian officer. Both of those sadly stolen in the 1990s and, and that became a very common thing at that time. The plaque on the right I have traced to a collector in Australia and just before Covid I'd been in touch with him and we were discussing how this thing could be returned to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and be replaced on his grave. And of course, that's another thing that's been kicked down the road a bit by COVID. So hopefully we'll return to that. But it was other things that were there that have now gone as well. And the, on the left there, that's International Corner near Popperinger uh, in Flanders. It was a main road, road junction for the resupply of the frontline area during the Great War. Um, and one day in the 90s, the farmer woke up and decided he didn't like it anymore and he demolished it. And this great landmark with that original painted sign on it was gone forever. And on the right, that's a little track that went from uh, Becourt on the Somme to Freecourt, took you up towards Freecourt New Military Cemetery, and it's the remains of a GS wagon sitting there in the undergrowth up against a ruined wall. Long, long gone, unfortunately. Um, so this shows how the battlefields have changed. They've changed in my time, but if I you know, I spoke to my old pal John Dreyer, we talk about a lot in the podcast, or Tony Spagnoli, who wrote a lot of books on the Great War. They went over in the 50s. They knew a very different Western Front to me, just as I know a very different Western Front to many of you, and just as you will know a very different Western Front to those in 20 years' time. I suppose that's, that's how it goes. But at the time as well, you could regularly bump into veterans when you were out there, and all of these men, with the exception of the Frenchman on the right there, I got to know and interviewed uh, Harry Banfield on the left-hand side, who served at Oppie Wood with the Bedfordshire Regiment. Harry Fellows with the poppy cross in his pocket. He was with the Northumberland Fusiliers uh, at Lewes and at uh, Mamet's Wood. His ashes are scattered in Mamet's Wood. There's a little headstone to him there. Uh, Hugh Parry Morris in the middle there was an MM winner. He got the MM at the Rava Beak uh, near Polygon Wood in October 1917. And Tom Price on the right, uh, who was a, raw, a South Wales Borderers veteran, who was responsible for the creation of the Welsh Division Memorial at Mamet's Wood. He went with uh, some other veterans, uh, and I bumped into them and went round with them at that time, to Mamet's Church, where the original divisional plaque was, felt that it wasn't enough, and called, inspired this group of people to build a new memorial, which is the Red Dragon that we know in Death Valley at Mamet's Wood today. So sadly, poor old Tom never lived to see that memorial unveiled, but it's his great legacy to his comrades who he saw drop around him there in the attack of July 1916. And that those days when we used to bump into veterans like that, I, I miss those greatly. And I and I feel for those of you who've never ever had that experience. It's one thing that you know I think was missing during, understandably missing during the Great War centenary, but which I wish could not have been missing because to go to the men in gate as I did in the 80s, and, and there would be a veteran standing there wearing his medal as he'd come along with his family and just to have a chat with him and he'd talk about his mates who were on the monument and so on. That really was quite something. And of course that led me down a long path of visiting these battlefields, living in Sussex then, it was easy for me to get across and I would go across a lot of times every year. That led me to being asked to do battlefield tours for friends in a minibus and then in a coach. And then 25 years ago, I was approached by the directors of Ledger Holidays to set up a battlefield tour for them. They weren't really sure if anyone would book on these tours, um, but it changed the battlefield tour landscape. Tours were very expensive 25 years ago and Ledger Holidays came along and offered a four day tour for £89. Pick up anywhere in the UK, stay in a three star hotel, 
go across in a coach, go on your P&O ferry, et cetera, and have a battlefield guide. And it opened those battlefields up to people in a way uh, that previously was quite difficult and really had not been opened up in such a way, probably since that interwar period of the 1920s and 30s. And other companies followed suits and did tours, which is a good thing, and the whole market expanded. And what it meant most importantly is thousands of people had a chance to get across and visit these battlefields and visit graves and visit sites and see memorials and do everything that has helped put the Great War back on the landscape, back on the map, um, and bring it into the fore as it justly deserves. And for me as well, I would say, particularly in the last decade, since, since I got myself a decent Nikon camera uh, and began to photograph the battlefields, I think doing that, looking through a lens and doing a lot of the things that I've done, uh, not just on tours, but with television as well. I've had the, the privilege of doing that for, for nearly 20 years ago, uh, for nearly 20 years now. But looking through the lens of a camera and reimagining the battlefields and the landscape that you see, many of you will probably be sick to death in my pictures of Corselet British Cemetery taken at different times of the years. But it, it is one of those places where it feels as if the crisscross paths of the Great War do come together there, both on the landscape and in the sky above. And, it, and I think doing this has changed my view, my impression and how I see these battlefields. And, and it's an ever changing thing. And I think that's part of the beauty of this is that how we see and reflect and we change how we act and react to the places that we see as we visit on these battlefields. And it, it's something that I've tried to do in the podcast to try and express this in words I suppose in, in, in many many ways because making these journeys going across this landscape it's all part of that fascination of the old front line thank you very much so that's that so now then uh, what I'm going to try and do uh, we'll have a look in the chat I'm sure there might be some uh, some some questions here. Um, I'm not even sure what the time is. Oh, there we are. Not done. Not done too bad. Um, it's just under an hour, so that's not too bad. So um, let's have a look at, um, at any questions. That would make another interesting book, Paul. Yet yeah, funny you should say that. Um, I do plan to do a book on the aftermath of the Great War. Uh, which is going to be all photographs, because these are just a handful of the images that I've got connected uh, with this. Sarah says, I was lucky enough to meet H Henry Allingham a couple of times before he died. Such an amazing experience to have that connection to living history. Absolutely, Sarah, because that, you know, like I say, that is one of the things that was that was kind of missing from the Great War centenary. Um, uh, and I, you know, very much regret that for everyone concerned because, you know, it would have been an impossibility. But um, but the, the missing aspect of the men who were there and the women who were there, of course, as well, was it was a part of it that that was, you know, sad for me uh, in many respects. How about a battlefield tour for the podcast Patreons? Yep, that is something that's crossed my mind, too. Um, and that's something we're going to look into for a future uh, for a future date. Um, Alistair says, out of interest, what took you to live on the Somme? Was it planned or sheer luck and coincidence? And that's a good question. Well, um, nearly, uh, nearly 30 years ago now, uh, I was doing a job that I didn't particularly like, the only other job I've ever done, really, and decided to resign from that, save a bit of money, and go across to the Somme for three months to write a book on walking the battlefields which no one had done at that point. Um, uh, and that's what I'd wanted to do for many years. And, and that's what I intended to do. So I headed off for three months and 10 years down the road, I was still there. So it sort of kind of came together. And I think probably at that point in my life, all roads led to the Somme. And, and that was a good thing because living there did add a different uh, dimension to it. And, and certainly it's nice for me to think my daughter, Poppy, uh, still lives there, still lives at Corselet. And so it's sort of carrying on that tradition, going out and about on the battlefields. And that's, uh, and that's a good thing. Did you begin the podcast and expectation that we would use them as audio guides when we return from Gerald? Um, that's a good question. And I, and I think, yeah, I know we've discussed this, Gerald, but uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's something in that. Um, they could be, you know, 
plug and play and head off around the battlefields and visit some of these places. That might be something that we look into as well uh, as part of going forward with the, uh, with the podcast. Alan says, when and where are you leading your next ledger tour? Ah, oh, now, that's a good question, Alan. Um, I wish uh, <laughs> I could have a crystal ball to tell you. There's quite a few issues, again, across the Europe at the moment, as you may be aware of. We're hoping that tourism will begin again um, at the end of August. Um, and with any luck, um, I might be leading a tour in the last few days of August um, back onto the battlefields. If not August, I hope it will be September. Um, because the battlefields really, really do need us. The places that we go to, the locations that we frequent to get food and drink and everything, and museums that we go to really, really need us. Um, and we need to get back there as soon as possible, I think. Uh, George says, uh, I feel a walk along the Sombre Canal and a Wilfred Owen talk would be a great podcast. Don't worry, that's coming um that that will come for sure your time at course is from barry hutchinson uh, must have been uh, amazing to be so close to the area of passion it was the great war was all around when i dug the back garden up um then uh, uh i found shrapnel balls and cartridges and bits of shell shard and stuff like that it was just absolutely everywhere and people would knock on the door and hand things over it was quite something really um Galaxy J4, which I suspect is your tablet, says a great chat. Uh, is there any way of finding out more about the dead German soldier? His name was Michael Schaefer. He seems to have been in infantry regiment number 45. I've looked him up on the uh, the Volksbund, Deutsche Volksbund uh, website. He's buried at St. Quentin, St. Quentin, in the German cemetery there. But there's no details about where he came from. So I've kind of hit a bit of a, a brick wall there. If anyone else can help with that, then I'd be greatly uh, appreciative of that. Uh, Frank says, and thank you, Frank, you, I know you, you're always very positive about the podcast on Twitter, and I really appreciate that. Uh, why do donations to Patreon attract a tax? Why don't you get it all? Uh, well, that's, I guess, the downside of any sort of uh, platform like that. Um, yeah, you'd have to ask Patreon, really, but it, it's all part of how these things function. Um, and I guess to have a platform where we can do something like this to enable the support of creatives and um and so on is, is is a good thing it, it comes with a cost they have to recoup some of that cost. then you know i guess we understand that as part of our business operates um but i appreciate what the, the sentiments lie behind that frank that's very good of you uh were the french more likely to replicate former buildings than the belgians flanders always seems more modern apart from eep yeah that's a good question that's from tim that's a good question tim um i think that generally i mean they replicated eep as you know pretty much using the medieval uh, plans. And when you look at the villages, they're laid out pretty much on a similar way, but I think that there's been a lot of modern building in Flanders in a way that there hasn't been in Northern France. And the Belgians have, have got fabulous architects when you look at their, their buildings. Um, so I think that it looks more modern. Um, but if you look at the 20 stuff, um, then some of which has been removed actually over the years, then it is much more re replicant of what was there before the war. What's the best source for trench maps and also a guide as how to use them and apply against modern maps would be great. That's from Stuart. Um, that's a good question. I mean, th there is uh, the trench map, Great War digital trench map system, which is probably the best. I mean, I, I use that have used it in the field. I use it more on a desktop now, to be honest with you, um, where you can put pin marks on there uh, where a trench is or trace a trench, and then flick to a modern air photo or uh, IGN or Belgian NGI map, and it comes, shows you where it is on the landscape. That's quite good at doing that. There's a couple of online sources that have trench maps. Um, One's a Canadian archive and uh, Scottish Library, I think, is the other one. They have pretty good collections of trench maps, which are free to use. And um, you can then work out, I think, one on one of them, what the GPS location is, and then look at that on, on Google Maps. So that's one way. Yeah, someone said Linesman, the Great War Digital Products. Um, it's worth, I mean, if you go to the battlefields a lot, then Linesman is worth having. You can buy a tablet version that comes with a tablet, 
plus a load of pre-loaded maps. And it is a remarkable bit of kit that is extremely useful for trying to understand the battlefields. Well, thank you, Gerald, for your comments there. I'm just working my way through these, ladies and gentlemen. Bear with me, there's quite a few of them. Um, someone asked a question about trenches being filled in. How did that happen? It was a gradual process. I mean, in the, the, the years after the end of the war, a huge number of British soldiers stayed behind and they had the Chinese Labour Corps, 100,000 Chinamen working on it, plus German prisoners of war as well. Um, and uh, that uh, they all helped fill in the landscape. And the first evidence I saw of this was with the diggers. They, they excavated some shell holes where the battlefield detritus had just been thrown in it after the war, just tons and tons of barbed wire and stuff. And that's what they did. They did. They used the shell holes and they chucked the stuff in there and covered it over. Um, so it was a big, big clear up process that took a long time. I tried, uh, Joe Nichols says, I tried 10 years ago to get a plaque memorial at International Corner, but without success. I intend to try again. Any thoughts? Um, Dominic Dendoven, who works at the Flanders Fields Museum, is on Twitter. Um, that's from Rick, sorry. Um, I, I'd have a word with him, um, who might be able to point you in the right direction for that one. Do Germans not travel much in the 20s due to shame or dislike of the Allied peoples that defeated them? That's from Jack. That's a good question, Jack. I suspect it was, I'm not sure, I think shame's too strong a word of it. I just think that their economy did not sustain the ability to travel, to afford to travel in a way that by the 30s, with the emergence of a new Germany and the National Socialist government moving people towards full employment, put money in their pockets, you know, we now know the darker side of that and where all that money came from and the background to it. Um, but what it did mean at that time is that Germans began to travel. So you see in things like 20 years after and, and some of the veterans things at the time, pictures of German pilgrimages to the battlefields. Um, and photographs like that of, the, of the, that couple visiting the grave at St Quentin is a, is a good example of it. I don't, that wouldn't really have been possible in the 20s, I think. You know, if we think of those um, wheelbarrows full of banknotes and that was just to buy a loaf of bread, I mean, you know, we can only but imagine what it must have cost to uh, um, <laughs> afford a trip from Berlin to, uh, uh, to Albert, um, you know, who knows? Um, Jude says, uh, generally, how long did it take for the wooden crosses to be replaced by stone? Fascinated by the pilgrimages. Um, that's a good question. The first cemeteries were con constructed in the early 20s. Within about 10 years, I would guess about 70% of them were done. And then between about 1930 and September 38, um, the, the rest of them were 99% complete. There were cemeteries such as uh, London Cemetery Extension at High Wood and uh, Canadian Cemetery Number no. 2 on Vimy Ridge that remained open and still had a large number of wooden crosses when the Second World War broke out uh, and they weren't replaced with headstones until after World War II. So it was something that, that took a while to be completely finished. And of course, after World War II, they had the addition of Second World War graves to then create cemeteries and, and, and replace crosses with headstones there. Um, any plans for a podcast about the Royal Flying Corps RAF from Richard? Yes, that's going to come. Don't worry about that. Um, this is from Ross. Any more uh, visits to the French sections of the Western Front? Yes, that's definitely going to happen as well. Um, Le Lange down in the Vosges will be an example of that. It's going to be a podcast on that. Um, someone said National Library of Scotland. There's a large amount of trench maps. Yep, I think that's the one I was mentioning before. Uh, Jerry asked about the war in the air and at sea. I will be talking about the, the war in the air and a bit about the war at sea. Uh, my grandfather was in the Royal Navy during the Great War. He was at Gallipoli with them in 1915, but he was afloat in different places either side of that. Um, it's not something that I have a massive knowledge of, but th there's some bits of it that are quite interesting, particularly connected with the Western Front, the way that the, the, there were naval forces up on the coast there. So we might do something on that in, in due course. And of course, the Zeebrugge raid uh, in 1918 and, and the attack on Ostend uh, are all uh, quite interesting subjects for a future podcast which will come I promise. Um, Neil says will you be looking at the Belgian army at some point um, Newport downwards yep um, again I, I, there's there's a really good walking route there along the old railway line between Ramscapel and, and Pavise uh, 
which I kind of held back from doing anything on because I'd like to walk it actually and, and then do the recording on the ground there because um, there's quite a lot of interesting things to see there. So that will come, I promise that. Stephen Hunt says, have any museum sites closed permanently due to COVID? Thankfully, I don't know of any. Um, one of the tasks, I, I went back to work uh, full time again uh, about a month or so ago to get prepared for our battlefield tours. And uh, one of the things I've been doing is contacting everybody that we deal with, which is pretty much every battlefield location uh, on the Western Front. Uh, and I don't know of any that have gone permanently. There's a few that have suffered greatly and desperately need us to return and have had to sell things from their collection, but not have disappeared, which is good because I feared that that might happen. Mary says, why do you think the Germans thought their missing weren't worthy of a memorial? That's a good question. And, and it's a question you can ask of the French as well, because they don't have memorials to the missing either. It's a British thing. Um, well, I think with the, the French, they decided to commemorate every Poilu on a war memorial. So you would be commemorated where you came from, on your village war memorial, on your town or your city war memorial, you'd be commemorated there. And if you had a grave, then the grave could remain in a battlefield cemetery if that was retained or moved to a larger cemetery like Notre Dame de la Rette, um, or brought back uh, to be buried in your local cemetery. So where I lived at Corsolette, there was the grave of a soldier killed on the Chemin de Dame uh, there in 1917. It was brought back in the 1920s to be buried in Corselette Cemetery. With the Germans, um, I, I just don't think that there was uh, really a desire to commemorate the, the missing or even an understanding of that perhaps um, in the same way. I mean, in the post-war world, I, I don't think that it was high on Germany's list to look to commemorate the dead from the Great War. Although when you visit Germany, um, and this is often a surprise to people, there are war memorials in almost every location from the Great War. Um, you have to scratch around to look for them sometimes, but they are pretty much there. And some of them are incredibly, uh, um, uh, they're amazing designs uh, and, uh, and include incredible detail. Um, but the Germans themselves are not entirely aware of them in many respects. I mean, I, particularly in the East, I, I went to a, a village in what was former East Germany, um, where there was a fabulous war memorial, which we were, I was with there with some ledger guides and we were looking at it. And it listed all the men from the village who'd been killed in date order, rank, unit, place of death, date of death. So we were looking at it and there were a lot of casualties at Verdun and on the Somme and so on. Uh, and a guy came out and said to us in German, uh, you know, what are you doing? So we replied, or I replied, uh, we're just looking at this war memorial. And he said, what war memorial? And I said, well, this war memorial. He said, well, that's not a war memorial. I said, well, yeah, it, it is a war memorial. It's to the, the First World War. He said, what do you mean First World War? He said, there's no such thing as a First World War. There's only the war against fascism, 1941 to 45. And of course, this is someone who'd grown up entirely in, in, in a, you know, East German, um, German Democratic Republic, as it was called, um, Soviet satellite nation, et cetera, et cetera, and had no concept of what it was. And I think that that is, it possibly explains some of the reasoning behind why for a long, long while people just were not um, from Germany, were not visiting the battlefields. I think that's changing. If you look at social media, a lot of German researchers and historians on there now, that's really, really good because we have to see this in, you know, in its global aspect and, and the more voices we hear, the better, really. Uh, love. Uh, be interested to know. Uh, this is from Damon. Hi, mate. Uh, be interested to know more about the Royal Naval Division at Antwerp. Yep, that's another one that I intend to do something on, uh, and the forts at Antwerp as well. Any plans for covering the rear areas and the railheads? Funny you should mention that. Then yes, uh, and I've got one coming up on the. On the base hospitals as well, looking at that side of it. And then Sarah says, is Eric's plaque from his family still on his grave? Thankfully, as far as I know, Sarah, from uh, a few months ago, yes, it is still there on his grave. It's been there now for 102 years and long may it continue. So, voila. Um, there we are. That's some questions. So I hope it's been an interesting afternoon for you. Um, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for listening in. Thanks again for all your support. Um, 
this is not a one-off, I don't think. This is, I hope, the start of something that we'll do on a regular basis to uh, support, uh, to thank, rather, for me to thank those of you who support um, the podcast. And for those of you who are listening on Catch Up, when I put this onto a platform where you guys can watch it, you haven't been able to make it today. Thank you as well. I thank you all, really. Um, and like I say, this is just the start. I mentioned the idea of community, and I think there is a community. Um, you know, I think that knowledge is there to be shared, and and uh, uh, and we've all got something to give. Um, and we've got some fantastic institutions like the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and the work it does in the regions and and um, and with the internships all needs our support and help and everything. And I think that's, you know, can all be part and parcel of where we're all coming from. So on this Saturday afternoon, um, thank you all for joining. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I certainly hope to see some of you again, either here or once we return to the old front line. Thank you very much. <laughs>